So I hope you guys get it. Can we try this again? Gold is best. Best, best, best. <laughs> Don't buy anything else than a gold iPhone. Welcome back to Objective Cologne. Uh, this is day number two. And the first, yesterday I thanked uh, all the attendees from 2012. This year I want to thank the speakers from 2012. Uh, so um, first of all, there were uh, my good friends, Ken and Glenn Aspaslak. So let's do a trivia. You know what I'm going to ask you? Yeah, well, first of all, a round of applause for them. <laughs> but then the, 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 <laughs> the, the usual quiz trivia is who's who. All right, who's Ken? Bottom or top? Who's for bottom? Who's for bottom? Who says Ken is the one on the bottom? Raise your hand. Who, it's unfair. Those guys know them very well. And all the other... Uh, who thinks, who thinks, uh, um, thinks this is the one on the top? Meryl, you're wrong. <laughs> so Ken is the one on the bottom and Glenn is the one on the top. Uh, yeah, and if you know those guys for years, uh, it's easier to tell, but at the beginning, it's very, very confusing. Um, all right, I think this guy is in the audience. Alex, where are you, by the way? Oh, you're there. So Alex from last year, uh, Alexander Repti, a round of applause for him. <laughs> also for coming back. And for, by the way, I think you were the first one to order a ticket. I'm pretty sure you were. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you tried the beta version of the ordering system. All right, um, let's go to uh, a duchy or almost past the duchy. Drew McCormack from Amsterdam. Round of applause for him, very quickly. <laughs> and then, since we have to win some time, I'm going to be faster on the next one. Felix and Oli were from Worldcraft. Then there was the amazing uh, uh, Jason Harris, which we might see again later uh, on video. Martin Winter now has moved to um, England. Uh, so that's the reason why he's not with us. But Martin has still done um, a few uh, work on the, the logos this year and things like that. He, he made this year clear what this weird logo is. It says now Coco Conference with the proud European uh, stars. And Zeno, uh, the, the, the French guy from last year. Uh, oh, by the way, speaking of uh, the twins, um, that if it was hard to tell who was who on the pictures, it's probably even harder to tell who is who in a sumo fight. But this is Ken versus Glenn at NS Conference 2009. Uh, and don't forget tomorrow, for those of you who can make it, I hope many of you can make it, and I will probably invite others, uh, people from outside. Uh, there is the coding day, coding day tomorrow, so um, if you don't uh, remember where it is, just go to startplatz.de. Uh, Thanks to Startplatz for hosting tomorrow. It's going to be fun. Some of you, at least, uh, are going to be there. Uh, yeah, be there at 9 a.m. We will code all, all day until 5, and we will show on the projector or the presentation at 5 p.m. And we'll leave at six. Let's move to the actual meet. Uh, I'm speaking about your talk, not about uh, the person itself. Uh, with Mike Lee, a technical keynote because yes, Mike Lee is not only someone who can shout at some people and tell them to fuck off. He actually knows this stuff and is actually a developer like you and me, guys. Uh, and now I'm just realizing why. Oh yeah, I wanted to show. Uh, to remind you a few seconds what happened here last year. Like, why do you still work at this company? You know, like, you look at his body language. He's like, yeah, no one's going to use OpenDoc, right? He says, I was in favor of putting a bullet in the head of OpenDoc. Can you imagine? What a dick. I mean, this is the kind of, these, these are the kinds of things that, that, that get the man branded as an asshole, right? These kind of men. So if you haven't seen that, go watch the video. They are now all free, by the way, the 2012 video. Some people after the conference were kind of inspired by Mike and had printed Mike's uh, video in different flavors on their uh, board with shipping um, on his fist. And um, yeah, tweeted about that. And uh, yeah, it's uh, what they call an unhealthy addiction to Mike. Um, all right, so uh, Mike, 
is going to tell you all about uh, uh, new lemurs and their game and things like that. So let's give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Lee. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to talk about high performance UI kit, or as you probably know it, uh, UI kit. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and call myself uh, Mike Lee PI on this one for a performance investigator. You see, it, performance has always been one of my favorite topics because, you know, we, we spend a lot of time programming and, and, and a lot of us uh, like to consider ourselves engineers, but most of the time we're programming and not really engineering. Engineering is about solving problems. And most of our problems have already been solved. But performance is always a detective story. Performance is not just a matter of knowing how to use the tools. Performance really requires you to think outside the box and, and, and come up with some really creative solutions. It always seems for me that performance is the part that I enjoy the most, reducing complexity. And this stuff goes all the way back to the invention of this stuff. In fact, I, I, given sort of the state of things in the world and, and, and where we are, I, I was really thinking about this a lot. Um, you know, the first shots in the information war were actually fired by Germany during World War II, the last great physical war. Um, for a long time, Germany had total control over the flow of information in this war because they had the same spy technology as everyone else to listen to what everyone else had to say, but they also had something new. They had encryption. They had the ability to say their most secretive things in a way that nobody could hear. They had the power of the enigma. That might be the wrong graphic. I'm not really sure what the enigma looked like. <laughs> um, on the other side, what we had was uh, a couple of engineers, a gay mathematician, and a bunch of women. Uh, you might remember this guy, uh, the father of computer science. A lot of people, they don't really understand what happened back then. They, they know about the Enigma, they know about the Colossus, they know about the invention of the computer, and, and they've heard the name Bletchley Park, but, I mean, how many of you have actually been to Bletchley Park? Like, one. That's a real shame. You should all go. This is, it's a rare opportunity to see where this stuff was invented and to hear the stories that you don't get to hear of the sacrifice that people made in order to, you know, let us throw birds at pigs. So the thing is, it wasn't the computer that won the war. It was the computers that won the war. The computers were the women who processed the numbers before the electronic computer did the last bit of work. But the real genius of the Colossus was not what the Colossus could do, because the Colossus could only go through a couple million iterations in a day. It wasn't, that, it wasn't that fast. It was Alan Turing's ability to see through the numbers, to narrow down the possibilities from billions to millions that let the boys in the lab, and by boys I mean girls, because they were almost all girls, do the heavy lifting to actually get this stuff cracked. And what was the performance advantage of the Allied forces? Well, the German High Command would change the codes of the Enigma machine every 24 hours. And it took 23 hours to crack the code. And so it was that one hour of time, that slightest performance advantage, that won the first battle in the information war. Well, when I entered the information war some 60 years later, it was an entirely different kind of enemy. But it was the same basic stakes. We were trying to protect our transportation infrastructure. And now, the soldiers in this war wore a different badge. But most of you have very little insight into how this whole process actually worked, how the tools in this battle actually worked. I'm going to explain how this stuff worked. The information about who is and is not allowed to fly in airplanes, or who can fly in airplanes but while being closely monitored, 
is maintained by the Transportation Safety Administration. And somewhere between that and the airline is the ability for you to actually check in and get going where you're trying to go. The actual route of that information is surprisingly circuitous. At least it was. You see, this information was maintained as a series of Excel spreadsheets that the TSA would shit out on a random schedule. It was then up for security experts at the airline to take this information, to print it out onto paper, to manually compare the two lists of about 15,000 names and figure out what had changed so they could generate a diff which could then be put into the reservation system. This process took about two hours and had an unknowable lack of accuracy and efficiency. And so, what eventually happened was all of that effort was replaced with one giant computer. And when I say giant computer, I mean it was literally the best microcomputer hardware that you could buy at the time. It was a Dell box that had maximum performance, maximum RAM, and a custom JVM running a single program written by this asshole. Past me. Ugh. Well, this only took four minutes. Had a guaranteed accuracy and had an efficiency of, of, I don't know, better than some dude printing something out and comparing it with a red pen. Case closed. Or at least case closed for a little while because what eventually happened was that the lists actually outgrew Moore's Law. Even though it was written in Java, the hardware couldn't keep up. Why? I didn't understand. I had no idea. I didn't know what I was doing at all. It's terrifying that I was even responsible for this stuff. But that's how it was. And later I would come to learn uh, what exactly was the situation here. So you understand the problem, right? We're talking about basically two arrays of data. And the array in this case was about 15,000 items, but it's not so much important what the number of items is. Let's just say that the array contained n number of items, where n is some number. Uh, and you're comparing two lists against themselves for additions and deletions, which means they're about the same size. So you're basically comparing two arrays of size n. And so I would just take these lists and I would basically take the first item and compare it to every number in the list. And then I would take the second item and compare it to every number in the list, where by number I mean name. Uh, and on down the line, uh, and if you actually do that math, what you end up with is approximately, actually exactly, uh, n squared operations. Which we call an efficiency of big O, n squared, operational efficiency of n squared. For any n items, there will be n squared operations. For the 15,000 items, therefore, there's what, 225 million operations and then times two, because I had to do it in reverse to get the addition, so that's about 550 million operations. It's a lot. It's a lot of memory. It's a lot of time. In fact, if you look at the list of Efficiencies, n squared is, uh, is right up there between impossible and just kind of bad. For those of you who aren't familiar with, uh, with operational efficiency, there's basically five operational efficiency magnitudes, right? There's constant time, big O of one, which means it takes the same amount of time, whatever, it doesn't matter, n could be a billion, it's the same. There's logarithmic efficiency, which is fantastic if you can get it. And you can get it, actually. It's surprising how knowing about this stuff helps you in real life. Like I once had in, in, in this library, you know, this 10,000 item library, and something made the damn thing crash. Some record out of 10,000 made it crash. So I could have sat there and gone through and eliminated each record at a time, but luckily I had learned about efficiency, so I would just delete half of the data at a time, and so it only took me, you know, the binary log of n to get there, just to say it took me fewer than 10 steps. Git has something called git bisect, which does this exact thing for you. If you're trying to figure out somewhere between, you know, now and way back when things broke, what's the fastest way to figure that out? Git bisect. It actually would do a binary search on your commits until you figure out what it is. Binary search in general, log in, good stuff. N is standard efficiency. N means that for N items, you're gonna do N operations. It's, 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 it's linear, that's what you would expect for most things. N squared is bad. In my code, I, and when I teach students as well, I, I teach them, you want to return early and keep your stuff indented as far to the left as possible. And one of the reasons for that is because 
When you do it this way, when you find further layer of indentation, this is where the n squared algorithms are hiding. Do a loop inside a loop and see if you don't have n squared efficiency. Not good. And then, of course, there's n factorial and other exotic, you know, theoretical, non-computable problems. But what does this mean in practice? Let's look at the big chart that you should all be pretty well familiar with at this point. Uh, for values of n between 1,000 and a million, which are pretty normal values, I think, uh, you know, constant time stays constant. Log grows very slowly. But already in n squared, you start getting into, you know, scientific notation size numbers by the time you get to a million records. And, you know, we consider n factorial and things like that to be incalculable because, I mean, you have a million records and that requires a number of operations with 5.5 million digits. Not 5.5 million operations, a number of operations with 5.5 million digits. That's a lot. Well, of course, sorting the thing would have made it a lot easier. And you can spend all day looking at tables like this of different sorting algorithms and, and, and different efficiencies and different trades between time and space and best case versus worst case. You can spend all kinds of time tuning your algorithms. But anybody here who's been doing this stuff for long enough knows what the actual solution to this problem is. It's a simple set operation. Why are you even using arrays for this? Like you shouldn't be. You're thinking about the problem all wrong if you are. It's not a linear problem, it's a set problem. You put the stuff in an array, sure, but then you put the array in a set, you minus the sets, you're done. Trivial, fast, easy. Could have just run it on my laptop in the background, no problem. It turns out that a lot of times, in fact, I'd say most of the time, the performance problem is you. And you're thinking about it the wrong way. For example, I don't need to tell you guys how to do performance, right? I don't need to tell you guys, for example, that you don't worry about performance until the end of at least the module. Then you crack open instruments, you run instruments, you figure out what's going wrong. We all know this. I'm not gonna teach you how to use instruments. There's a video, two videos for that, that come out every year. Every time I do performance, I watch the WWDC videos again, relearn how to use instruments, despite the fact that, like, when I worked at Apple, I gave the last workshop on Shark, which was the predecessor to instruments. I know this stuff pretty well. I have the singular honor of having been rejected from the performance team at Apple, which is, you know, it's pretty cool. If you're gonna be rejected by somebody, it's better that than, like, WebKit. A lot of times, though, you know, telling you that you should use instruments for doing your performance analysis is like telling police that they should carry guns. It's like, so what? I mean, that's not, that's, there's nothing new in that, right? It's, it's how you use the tools that's important. That's, that's the joy of performance. It's this detective work of once instruments tells you what's going on, you have to figure out what that actually means. For example, how many times has instruments told you that the problem is Objective-C itself? Damn, Objective-C is too slow. We all know it. We know Objective-C is slow. We know Objective-C message send is slow. We all know this. And so when we get something like this, when instruments tells us Objective-C is too slow, the solution is obvious, C++. Or you just add an auto-release pool and you know you're done, I mean. Like Objective-C is not slow, right? Objective-C is not slow. Objective-C message send is not slow. UI kit is not slow. None of this stuff is slow. All of this stuff is fast as shit. You're slow. You're dumb. I'm dumb. Here's the thing. UIKit will never be as slow as you are naive. You know, it's like, I can't tell you how many times I've had people look at that Objective-C message sent thing and just been like, these are the limits of Objective-C. There are no limits of Objective-C. Not that you will ever hit. Because as smart as you may be, you are not smarter than like 100 people at Apple. Right? Like, you might be smarter than five people at Apple, not 100. You're definitely not smarter than Bill Bumgarner. But see, this is the thing. This is the kind of premature optimization that will get itself into our minds and poison the way that we think about these things. And we all know this quote, right? Premature optimization is the root of all evil. We all trot this out without really thinking about what the quote means or who said it or why. Some of us know that Donald Knuth said it. And Donald Knuth must know what he's talking about. He told Steve Jobs that he was full of shit. Well, it turns out that when Donald Knuth said this, he wasn't actually saying this. He was actually quoting Tony Hoare. 
Uh, Tony Hoare, on the other hand, said uh, that he never said that. So I don't know. I don't know. Words were said, nobody actually backs them up. But not only that, that's not the whole quote, right? This is important. What he actually said was, we should forget about small efficiencies 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. But that's only 97%. You can fit the whole world in 3%. So what is the full root of all evil? Well, it turns out that I think the other 3% are real-time operations, rolling your own, and convenience API, by which I mean formats. String with format, predicate with format, anything with format, any synchronous thing that sits on top of an asynchronous framework, anything that's there to do it the easy wrong way so you can get it working before doing it the correct way, those things are never particularly performant. And it's good to recognize them in the framework. There aren't that many of them. Real-time operations are always gonna be a pain in the ass, right? When you're drawing and you're actually on the, the refresh loop and you have to actually draw in less than a 60th of a second, that's, that's always gonna be a performance pain. Audio processing, this kind of thing, anything you're doing in C nowadays is probably gonna be something in real time. You wanna avoid real time as much as possible. It's just where pain happens. And rolling your own, I mean, this is, this to me is the root of all evil. Thinking that you're smarter than 100 people at Apple coming up with something that is as fast as it is naive, only to discover that it's not really fast at all. It's just wrong. So what do you do when you don't know how to make any faster? And this happens a lot, right? Like I had a situation where instruments told me exactly what was taking all the time. It was in a third party autocomplete text field that we were using for some reason. And it would send out a network request with a block and the block would sit there in a while loop waiting for the request to return. Yeah, yeah it turns out that that's, that's what all the performance was being sucked up by. I mean, what do you do about something like that, right? That's, it's not just a question of not using formats. That's something more complicated. And when we were working on Delicious Library 2, you know, one of the big features that Delicious Library 2 added was the ability to sort of import your data from elsewhere. I mean, this was what 2 was all about. 2 was all about getting your data in and out. And uh, in order to do that, I had to be able to basically take any you know, tab or, or, or character delimited list and turn that into records. Now, instead of a, an N problem, we have an NM problem, where M is the number of fields and N is the number of records. And uh, you know, fields, of course, are what you're getting across here. Records are what you have a whole bunch of the time it takes to parse a record is, is significant, like five seconds or something, right? Like, like taking a bunch of information, figuring out what it is, what form it's in, what it means, and, and, and putting that into an object, that's just slow. And this was, this was the bottleneck, and so, I mean, what do you do about something like that? Well, you can spend all day looking at charts like this that tell you the relative real-time speeds of various operations in Objective-C and C++. You can get that five minute parsing time down to four minutes, I guess. But at the end of the day, it's a linear operation. Like no matter how fast you get your parsing, you're still gonna have to parse it n times because you have n records. I don't know how long I spent banging my head against this problem. I don't know how long I spent trying to at least make a user experience where you could leave the damn thing running overnight and it would import your data. It took a long time before I eventually figured out that you only need to parse one record because every other record is going to be in the same format. And so what I ended up doing was actually creating a parser using NSification, which is like one of the slowest things you can do. And then I would just use the invocation and apply it to N records. And so all of a sudden, the parsing step that is slow ceases to be linear, becomes constant, moves outside of the loop, and everything is fast. It's a, a fundamental rethinking of the algorithm. It's not a question of knowing which procedures are fast. It's a question of rethinking the way that you're doing things entirely. This happens a lot with the graphics system. 
graphics are one of these notorious real-time operations, and, and drawing something onto the screen is notoriously slow. A lot of times it turns out that the thing that's slow is actually the blat. It's actually putting something on the screen, and you're not really gonna, like, how are you gonna make drawing any faster than that? Years ago, I was working on this game, and it never actually ended up shipping, but I always obsess about it because it was such an interesting project. The game was called Pyrangle, and it was a game about fire safety. Basically, you know, it was one of these sort of marble tile games where these marbles would come down and they'd represent heat and fuel and, and, and air. And you'd have to stack them up and try to prevent those three things from coming in contact. And when those three things would come in contact, then, you know, the screen would basically burst into flames and you would get this like really lovely sort of animated uh, smoke effect that was going on. It looked a lot better than this. This is just demonstrative. Um, but this was like ancient history. This was like, you know, iPhone one kind of thing, right? And, and I tried everything to make this performant, to make this actually work. I mean, I, I, I tried messing around with the particle systems, uh, you know, and iPhone one could not really produce enough particles to make one realistic smoke plume, let alone a screen full of realistic smoke plumes. Eventually I figured out that I could sort of animate this in a certain way and I, I messed around with the layer order and, and a bunch of things like this until I finally got it kind of hardware accelerated. But at the end of the day, I, I simply could not get past the fact that I had to draw this damn thing 10 times. In this example, I mean, realistically, there were a lot of things on the screen, so this would be more like 100 times. But at the end of the day, that's what it was. Drawing this thing over and over and over again, it just took a lot of time. So what do you do? What do you do when you're up against the actual speed of the drawing system? Well, I think I did what most people would consider the thing to do, which is I went to OpenGL. In fact, I taught myself OpenGL, and I rewrote the whole damn game in OpenGL. And then I got to the point where I'm like, I wanna move all of these things over by five pixels and realize that it would be easier to just throw the damn GL away and go back to UIKit and figure out how to make it fast than it would be to continue wrestling with goddamn OpenGL. And so after weeks of this, eventually I figured out, oh wait, I have to draw this 10 times in this example, but I would only have to draw this four times. I denormalized the actual sprites because you actually would need two then, up and down. Denormalized the sprites, exchanged memory for drawing speed, and the same thing, if you look at it, you can actually draw this in four operations with the new denormalized sprites. It's thinking utterly outside the box. It, well, for me, it was outside the box. Maybe for you, it's really obvious in this whole time you're just gritting your teeth because you know all the answers. <laughs> That's how performance can be. A lot of times performance is, it's unexpected. A lot of times performance requires you to, to open your mind in ways that you maybe hadn't thought of before. Lemur's chemistry was a lot like this. Lemur's chemistry was a huge challenge for us. Lemur's chemistry was memory bound. It wasn't the only problem, but as far as performance, that's really what the issue was. If you don't know what Lemur's chemistry is, it's this game that I spent the last year with a team of people working on, which basically, it's a casual game, but it's about chemistry. Not fake chemistry, but actual chemistry, right? Where the elements are not fire and water and bullshit, but hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen. And then you combine them in a pleasing lemur-related way and learn a little chemistry in doing so. And a lot of people were surprised to learn that lemur's chemistry was actually done entirely in UIKit, like completely in UIKit. And there's a lot of going on the screen in lemur's chemistry. I mean, it's this really, really fast-paced, casual game. It's got particle effects, it's got, you know, sprite yin yang, all kinds of animations. It's got all of this like text art that's being created uh, and popped around on the screen, all kinds of everything, all kinds of stuff happening. Um, this like super, super custom real time audio engine, like it, it, it sounds like there's kind of a background symphony going on, but actually it's like composed in real time. So that for example, when you pause the screen, there's a seamless transition between the music, just the, the, the tiniest details that just required so much work. And we had this goal for ourselves, which is that we, we really wanted to be able to run this thing on every iPad, right? So we, we, we wrote it all the way down to 5.1 and we tested it on, on all the iPads. And it was 
We did all these things to make it faster, to make it performant, blocks especially. Like we, we, we just, we, we, we took everything to blocks and we just, you know, did all of this like parallelization stuff, like got our queues up in there, did all of the stuff that you would expect to happen uh, for performance. And then we tried running it on the iPad 1 and it was unplayable, it was unrunnable. I mean, it was stuttery enough on an iPad 3, but on the iPad 1, it was, it was unusable, and it seemed like everything that we did to try to fix the performance on iPad 3 actually made it worse on iPad 1, which was very upsetting to us. But we spent a lot of time messing with it. There's a lot of things that we had to do. I mean, weird things, like the more fingers you would put on the screen, the slower it would get. How weird is that? And by the way, totally acceptable as an experience. Well, because it turned out that when you would put your fingers on the screen as like a feature that like nobody even notices, if you select a molecule, it tells you all the molecules that will react with that which means that it needs to basically look at everything that's on the screen and run through its little chemistry engine and figure out what all the reactions are and what reacts, basically hundreds of times per second. And the chemistry engine was just a big table of formula, you know? So it'd be like, oh, you've got O2, you've got H2, those will combine and those will form, you know, one of these radical groups. How hard is it to stick two strings together and compare them? I mean, it's not very difficult, but when you're doing it hundreds of times every second, it can become very difficult. And it turned out that, yeah, string parsing was killing us. And so we came up with this, you know, elaborate integer-based system where basically all of the individual molecules were given, uh, you know, they were all enumerated pipes. Uh, did some very clever like number packing so that basically you could fit an entire reaction into a single 32-bit integer. So that basically if you were to say compare two numbers, then the range of numbers between them would be the legal reactions. I mean, all kinds of fancy stuff. All kinds of fancy clever stuff that, that, that you should never do except when that's the actual thing that's killing you. But it's funny because it seems like every time I'm doing performance stuff, even though I will find legitimate performance problems that need fixing, even though I will find legitimate you know, algorithmic issues that need dealing with. I always find bugs too. I always find things that, that, that are just not working properly. For example, you know, we have these, these flowers in the game. And the flowers, of course, uh, they're, they're, they're created entirely in uh, uh, you know, a core image, right? So you have some generic images and then you use core image to make them different colors and whatnot. And uh, it's relatively expensive to generate new images with core image. And so we would cache these things. Um, and we thought, well, the flowers can't be the problem because they're all cached. But then we went ahead and hooked up a little uh, audio breakpoint to the creation of, of the graphics so that we could actually hear the cache misses as we were operating. And it was like a Geiger counter going off. Like the caching wasn't working at all. It was completely broken. There was like a race condition up in there and it was just it was like a total fail. Like we had assumed that this thing was working great. It wasn't working at all. A lot of times performance issues are just bugs. You know, like I would consider sitting in a while loop a pretty serious bug. But really the thing that was killing us with this was memory. And this one's tricky. Because first of all, the, the, the memory, especially the texture memory, it's not really charged directly to your application. It's charged to springboard and core animation and, and things behind the scenes. You don't get a nice clear picture of memory eating your performance the way that you do for, you know, things that are processor bound. But I will say this, if you're using UIKit, memory is probably your biggest issue. I mean, this is one of these things that we kind of stopped worrying about for a long time until we went mobile with everything and all of a sudden it became an issue again. We went through the app, we did a total memory audit and mostly it had to do with blocks and our unfamiliarity with block memory management with things being retained when they weren't supposed to be retained we lowered our memory footprint to something that we considered to be more reasonable simply by going through and fixing bugs. That combined with the integer-based chemistry engine, the thing runs like a charm, runs like a champ, even on iPad 1. We're so, so incredibly proud of that.
So yeah, Lemur's Chemistry, it's awesome. I have stickers if you want them. If you have kids, let me know. I'll give you extra stickers for your kids. Now, of course, there is one other kind of binding, and, and, and it is really what binds the whole story together, uh, and that is being human bound. Really, performance is a human issue. We study performance because we need these things to be efficient for our users, so we don't waste their batteries, so we don't waste their time, so we don't lose their trust. But it's not the computer that's the problem, it's us that's the problem. And performance is not about just making things faster. Performance is about finding the bottlenecks of effectiveness. It's about applying effort where effort needs to be applied. You only polish the weakest link. Because if you waste your time polishing things that aren't your biggest problem, you're not solving anything. Identifying your biggest problem is not simply a performance issue as regards using instruments. It is a performance problem with our apps and in our lives. I mean, I've had several failures in my career. I've had several things that are not going as well as I'd like. Lemur's Chemistry has yet to be the number one app on the App Store. It's not even the number one educational app. And what is the number one educational app? Probably something embarrassing, involving primary colors, very little education. So, does it really matter that it runs on iPad 1? Was that effort really worth it? What is the biggest problem that we have? You know, as I look back, I realize that there's really been something that I've had in my successes and that I've lacked in my failures, and it really comes down to how I do my budgeting. For example, every project I've ever worked on that I've made the budget for, this is what the budget looks like. Development, 100%. Marketing, zero. This is what it needs to look like. I need to take my development estimates and double that for marketing. I am nothing. My team is nothing without marketing. It's how we let people know what we've done. Every time that I've thought to myself, I can do the marketing. I'm the best evangelist for this stuff that there could possibly be. It's, I mean, maybe if I had the time. I notice that the stuff that I'm worst at is the stuff that I'm best at because I don't have the time to do that stuff because I have to do the other stuff and I don't think to ask for help because I think I know what I'm doing. Also with Lemur's chemistry, other than the marketing issue, I mean I used to have a team of people that could help me with this, but they're all gone now. And they're all gone now because we went on this really nasty death march. And then, it was a death march that was basically based on the premise that, you know, me being nice wasn't doing anybody any good, and so it was time to get a little bit mean. And we marched and we marched, and it was really hard, and I mean, I've told the story before. And at the end of it, like, everyone was done. Nobody wanted to work on this thing anymore. Um, you know, and I, and I told myself it was totally worth it. Because what is burning through a few people for a new game dynamic that's never been done before, for new characters that can be utilized in all kinds of interesting ways? But I think I'm wrong about that. And this was really driven home for me last week when I was at, at, at 360 iDev down in Denver. And the, the keynote speaker was a, a woman named Brianna Wu. She heads a, a game studio called uh, Giant Space Cat. They're working on some pretty cool looking games. And she was talking a lot about uh, you know, kind of the psychology of the team and, and, and at the end, you know, she, she had this sentence that she put up. I don't care about you, I care about the product. God, I said this so many times during that death march. I don't care about you, I don't care about me, I care about this product and I care about shipping. And we shipped, but for what? No marketing budget, no team left, 
no one and nothing to have pride in. Just a great product that nobody cares about. Solving the wrong problem. I always think about this question right after my death march. One of my colleagues who has become so close to me that he's like my brother, this guy Hernan Pellicini. And we're having this big conversation about this stuff and he said to me, do you want to be right or effective? And my God, how that burns, even now. It is so natural for us to be right. It is so natural for us to know better, to assume that because somebody did something we don't like, that they must be a moron. Newsflash, everyone around you thinks they're surrounded by idiots, including you. It's just the natural state of things. I mean, look at our relationship to Apple. How many times does Apple come out with something and your initial reaction is, what? And you sit there and, and you tell yourself how you're right and they're wrong, how you're smarter than they are, how they really screwed this one up. You tell each other these stories until everybody believes it and you're all just wrong. And you're missing an opportunity to be wrong. It is so wonderful to be wrong. Because when you're wrong, you can learn and you can be better and, and getting better is the best part of this. Learning to be wrong. That's the greatest meta skill any engineer can have, any creative person can have, any artist can have. Let me give you an example of how you're all wrong about something. The leather. Why do you think that is, the leather? You think they just went too far? You think Scott Forstall is just that big of a dick? You all have no idea why that leather is there, but you think you do. There's a real opportunity to learn something here, but you're missing it because you think you're so smart. I know why the leather's there. Not because I'm so good that I can sit here and think about these things. I'm no better than you guys. Hell, I'm worse than you guys. Ask anybody. Ask Uli. Except Uli. Uh, <laughs> But the thing is, you know, there is no engineering without ego and arrogance. This is an arrogant pursuit to think you can change the world. It's just that we have to hold that stuff in check. It's just that it's never easy to manage our own attitudes toward things, toward each other. That's why we have friends who are hopefully better than us, who can tell us, dude, you're being a little too much of a dick. One of my protégés built that app with the leather. He worked with Steve himself. It's not that the leather is meant to make you think anything. It's that the leather is made, is there to make you not think of the obvious thing. How would you have made that app? Made it look like a radar? Made it look like the matrix? Made it look like you're tracking your friends? Leather is harmless. Leather is silly. Leather is stupid. Everyone's complaining about the leather and not about the fact that your phone is constantly surveilling you on behalf of everyone who gives a shit. That's why the leather. The next time you think you're right, try being wrong for a change. You will be surprised at how often the biggest barrier between UI kit and performance is you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, awesome talk, as usual. I know why you are back. And uh, questions? Hi, Mike. Uh, thanks for this talk. It was awesome. I have two questions. The first one is you mentioned um, uh, if you have this uh, this usual problem in instruments that uh, you are told that objective mass uh, send is uh, is the culprit, um, then you can use uh, auto release pools at um, certain locations. Um, sometimes it's obvious where these locations are. Sometimes it's not. Uh, is there any solution you have for the second? Um, problem, like when when you know there's many memory pressure and uh, and a lot of stuff going on, and uh, you want to introduce an auto release pool, and you don't know exactly where. Sure. I mean, first of all, understand it's not a memory pressure issue with the auto release pools. It's a too many operations happening at the same time is what it comes down to. 
Uh, most people never take the time to learn what auto-release pools are or how they work. I mean, they're basically just arrays. And releasing an auto-release pool is just sending everyone a message at the same time. So it's, you know, the problem is that if an auto-release pool has more than, I don't know, a million items or whatever, then it's going to take longer than the event loop cycle in order to drain. So you just need to keep the size of your auto-release pool small and they nest, so it just means you need to introduce an inner auto-release pool. It's usually in a loop. Uh, loops are often you know, places where you want to have an inner auto-release pool on a per loop basis. Blocks uh, are another instance. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of times it's not obvious where the problem is. And you kind of have to experiment. You have to try a few things. And that's why we have these, these, these profiling tools. It's funny because with these profiling tools, it almost makes it seem too easy sometimes. What's really weird is like, I teach a lot of students who aren't, are new to Objective-C and, and they don't envy our language, they don't envy our IDE, uh, they, they envy our, our performance tool, they envy instruments. Like, nobody has that. So, yeah, I mean, you just, you have this ability to experiment, to try things, and, and, and to see when the problems go away, and, and that's, that's how you do it. I mean, there's no hard and fast rule. Look for the loops. But uh, what I would love is like a heat map for this kind of stuff. You know, I'm a visual person, so that would be that would make stuff easier. I, I think I should uh, file radar or something. Um, so the second question is: You um, said that uh, you should invest 50% of your budget into marketing, um, and that's fine, and I sort of agree. But uh, how do you approach that if you're a developer and you have no idea of marketing, you have, you have totally no clue? Oh yeah, it's just like designers, right? I mean, it's really tempting to try to do your own design, but even if you're an awesome designer, like you, you don't, it's not what you're spending your time doing, right? You want to have somebody who's awesome at design, as awesome at design or more awesome at design than you are at, say, engineering, but doing design full-time. It's the same thing with marketing. Like, I'm not good at marketing, not really. Probably nobody here is. But like, for example, you know, at Amsterdam, we encourage marketing people to come because we need them, right? So like, you know, people say, how's the game going? It's like, we're waiting to find a, a, a partner with some marketing skill who can actually market this damn thing. And then people say, have you thought about like talking to schools? And it's like, of course we've thought about talking to schools, but like, we don't know how to do that. Like, that's what a marketing person does. You know, they find your customers for you. So yeah, I mean, find a partner and consider them your peer. That would be the way to do marketing. Okay, thank you. I would love to take another question, but we're running out of time. Thanks again, Mike. Big round of applause for the amazing Mike Lee. And yeah. Let's go for a short break, like five to 10 minutes, and then we'll move on with Alpine.